So I think it's time to start. I initiate the recording. and I hope you accept to be recorded because we will make this webinar available for offline visiting to everybody who is interested at later times. So welcome to this fourth webinar of the Sixth edition of 6456 standard about uh, testing uh, washing machines, especially in context of the round robin test. We want to inform you about the changes which are included in this new standard. And there are many changes, as you have heard already, especially by the first presentation. And we will go through these changes and uh, explain to you what is behind these changes and how they are ready. <clears throat> so today we have three topics which we will present to you. Um, it's a new evaluation method of a cleaning performance, which is a new term in the standard. And we will inform you also about the energy and water measurement and uh, energy uh, and water corrections, which are partly new. And we will have a new a uh, topic which is new in the IEC, it's a wash load temperature measurement. Um, so we are really measuring what is the temperature the wash load really reaches. And uh, today, uh, presentation will be given by, by Gundula Cicewski uh, for the second part and myself, uh, I'm Rainer Stamminger, I will do the first part. And um, I, start with a little picture of mine uh, when I was a bit younger, but uh, okay, I didn't get older. <laughs> if I want to introduce you, uh, me, uh, I'm myself to you, um, I'm chair of 59D, where, which is a subcommittee which is dealing with these uh, standards. And I'm personally engaged in the uncertainty uh, so well, how accurate our standard measurements are. Uh, in my profession, I am a professor at the University of Bonn. And uh, yeah, being retired, uh, but I worked for laundry appliance testing since more than 30 years. And uh, if you want to find something, what I did in my time in Bonn, you can look on the publications which I have made which you can find uh, on the internet, many. And if you need some, uh, you can write to me, and I can send it to you. The second presenter is Gundula Cicewski. Uh, you also know her because she has made uh, already one of the presentations uh, last week. And um, yeah, also, she is also very active in standardization at Senelec side and on IEC side, uh, is working at Bosch Siemens Hausgeräte, no, sorry, BSH House Home Appliances, and uh, is very active in the laboratory testing and developing washing machines. Yeah, we have um, a short agenda for today. Um, yeah, after the presentations, you have chance to ask questions. And so we think we can spend the two hours which we have planned today. Uh, if you have some questions in between, uh, no problem uh, to, to raise your hand. And uh, then I will give you the floor to, to ask questions. And no problem if you do this uh, also during my presentation, if something is unclear. So um, I will to talk to you about a new evaluation method for cleaning performance. Before I come to define what we mean with cleaning performance, let me first uh, try to tell you what we saw as a problem, what we have today with our measurement. You know, we are taking the photometer uh, reflectance value, which is uh, correctly called the uh, tree stimulus Y value. And we use this value 
where we are measuring the stains um, as a measure of the washing performance, as it is called today. So in, in general, this uh, photometer gives you a measured value, which is between zero and 100%. And uh, what we are measuring are the, the washed stains. And we get a value which is something like the, the brightness uh, or the, yeah, the reflectance value of this uh, stain from this uh, photometer. And uh, we are just taking these Y values of all the five stains which we have, and we sum them up. We take the sum of all the fives, and this is uh, our measure of the washing performance as we do it today. The problem is, as I see, as we saw, is that those uh, are very different, uh, these values, and also the, the change of these values is very different. So let me just uh, try to explain it once again. We have this photospectrometer and we are calibrating this instrument in having a black reference, which uh, we will take as a zero Y value. And we have a white reference. So where all of the, the light is reflected, uh, and this we take as a 100% reflectance measurement. Yeah, this is how we do it. And when we put in a washed stain, we measure uh, a, some, yeah, some value, which is not starting at zero, but it starts at a, uh, a certain value, which is the value, the Y value of the unwashed stain, because this is uh, what is the minimum value which we have, because normally by washing, uh, we get out, um, we take out some of the soil which we put in, and this will cause the uh, value to increase. So we start here at the end point of this green uh, arrow, uh, we start with the unwashed stain. And when the stain was washed in the washing machine, uh, uh, some of the stain is extracted and the uh, stain will get whiter. It will get a higher reflectance value. So this is somewhere at the uh, green arrow and it depends on the washing machine uh, how white uh, this stain comes out from the wash and this we are measuring as the uh, value which we will take later on and sum it up and take it as a measure of the washing performance. You know this uh, all very well, but just to show you some data, uh, I have uh, taken by, from, from one batch of the uh, soil fabrics, uh, Swissa 108. I took, uh, for all the five values, I took the unwashed value, which you see here in the first column. So with this 49.2 and the answer values, this is the unwashed stain. And uh, you see these values are already very different. So some are not as black as others. So blood is, is a very uh, strong soiling. So it's very dark at the beginning and therefore it has a very low value. Why others like the sebum are, are not as dark, they are gray. And, and so they have a value around 50. So this is the starting value of the unwashed soils. And when you put them into a washing program like a 60 degree cotton program, you wash out the stain and you reach then values which are higher. For example, for the sebum, it's 78. Uh, for the uh, blood, it's 88. So uh, it's one of the highest values, as well as for the red wine, it also gets a very white uh, stain uh, after the washing. And 
so we are taking just these maximum uh, value here, which is measured at the end of the program and sum them up and come here for this example to a value which is at 396. And this is our measure for, for the washing performance of this, of this washing program. When you just look at the difference, so how much this stain has increased its whiteness, so to say, then you can easily take the difference between the unwashed and the washed value. And here you find that we have very different changes. So the sebum has the lowest change. It just can, can get uh, more bright by 28.8 points, while the, the blood, for example, increases its value by 70. And so um, this is, so the, the gain which you can get from a certain washing program, it can be only the difference between the unwashed and the washed value. And uh, you see this gain uh, is very different. So here in this case between 28.8 and 70%. And this means that uh, these four stains contribute uh, very differently, differently to the overall washing performance. So the blood has a higher influence on a good total sum, as for example, the sebum has. Yeah? And this uh, we identified as, as a problem um, because uh, the influence of these stains is, is different. Um, and therefore we uh, thought about a, a new scale which we can introduce and this new scale we call cleaning performance. So we look on the, on the real cleaning effect of the washing program and this cleaning should consider the individual washability of the stains. So how much of the, the soiling can be washed out in a washing program uh, of this type of stain. So this is a scale which uh, is uh, stain dependent. And uh, to define this scale, we uh, take the values uh, from our uh, overall scale from zero to 100 of the photospectrometer. Uh, we take the range uh, which is possible only to clean. So in this range starts with the uh, unwashed value. So uh, this is the value where, let's say no washing process uh, would be or a very, very weak washing process. So there is nothing left. So we start with this value here, the beginning of the arrow, and say this is a, our zero point of this new cleaning evaluation uh, scale. Yeah? And if you want to define a scale, you need to have two reference points. So one is the beginning and the other is a second point. And this second reference point, we will we choose to be the value which this stain delivers when it is washed in the reference machine with the reference program. So as we are having um, this reference machine for our tests, we also have always <clears throat> the reference program run. And so we can take this value as a second reference point for our scale. And we define this point as 100% of this in this new scale. So with this, we, we can define <clears throat> a scale, a new scale where we have a zero point and a 100% point. And we can use this to identify a cleaning performance value of a test machine 
which would be the value which we are measuring on this uh, cleaning swatch, uh, on the stain swatch, uh, after the wash in the test machine. And as you see in the graph, this can be a value which is even above the reference machine value, which means we can have cleaning values which are higher than 100%, which is nothing uh, mysterious. It is just that this machine is cleaning better than the cleaning was in the reference machine in the reference program. Yeah. So this is a new scale which we define, um, which is then dependent on the on the stain, but also depending on the reference program of the reference machine which is used. Um, to use the scale, we need also some, some formulas. And these uh, formulas, they look a little bit complicated, but they are not complicated at all. So they are very uh, yeah, easily taking that what we have as measured values. Uh, we need one additional measured value, which is the value of the unwashed uh, stain. This is called the YS. And then we need the value of the uh, wash in the reference machine for, for this cycle, which we are looking at, uh, which is called uh, YR. And we need the value for the test machine, yeah, which is called YT. And then we just form this uh, formula, uh, which we, when we look on this uh, little equation, uh, let's start on this Y dash R. This is the delta uh, of the Y values between the wash in the uh, reference machine, Y R, minus ys, which is the starting value. That's why, where the s is coming from. So where we start, this is the unwashed stain. Yeah. So we take the difference in the y's. So this is the gain of the y's values in the reference machine. That is y dash r in the uh, denominator. And in the nominator, we make the difference between the y of the test machine and the starting value, so the unwashed stain. And this difference we call y dash t. Yeah? So it's the increase of the uh, reflectance values uh, in the test machine versus the increase of the reflectance values in the reference machine. And this gives you exactly this new cleaning performance uh, you can easily express it in, in a percentage value. So it can be 1.1 or 1.03 or 0 0.9. Yeah, it can be any value. And if it's one, uh, the washing is as good as in the reference machine. So this is the, the new formula which we use to calculate the cleaning values. So I think it's, it's very simple, straightforward to do it. Um, and if we calculate that, we for sure also have to look what are the uncertainties in this, um, in this formula, in this calculation. And the uncertainties are coming from the, from the variation of the, of the washing um, from the different uh, stains. So where they are in the washing program or in the, in the load. Uh, we know that there are differences, and for sure, we have also influence from one to the other washing uh, cycle. So we have also the repeatability of the washing, uh, which can be considered in this um, uh, cleaning performance measurement and assessment. So to calculate the standard deviation, we uh, just have to know the standard deviation of the different y's, which is um, simple, the, the y values which we have. So the y values of the blood stain, the y values of the sebum stain, also the y values of the unwashed stain. 
So we have measured that and we take the standard deviation just of those uh, Y values. And then having those standard deviations, we can uh, also calculate what is the standard deviation of the different uh, Y's, uh, Y dash is, which we are using here in this formula. So for, for these Y dashes, we can calculate the standard deviation, which is just the squared sum and the square root out of the square sum of those uh, standard deviations of the Y values. And this is for the Y dash T and the Y dash R. And then we can calculate the standard deviation of the C, the cleaning performance, which is just given uh, by this formula. So this looks a little bit complicated, but uh, with uh, Excel, uh, it's, it's easy to, to program it and uh, straightforward, but it needs a little bit of uh, Excel formatting. But you also have these formulas in the uh, template, which you are getting for the round robin test. So you can use also here uh, the formulas and copy and paste it in, in your spreadsheet. Yeah. So um, this is this new cleaning performance. Um, important is uh, we take the value for one individual swatch as the average of the four measurement points uh, because uh, those four measurement points are representing uh, this stain, stain swatch, this individual stain swatch. Uh, we, we could also think of that we uh, take um, a bigger spot and then we make only one measurement uh, of this bigger spot or we can take, let's say, 10 measurements of an even smaller spot. But by now, the spot size is defined by the measurement instrument. And so these four measurement points, they are covering so the surface of this uh, stain swatch. And they are taken as one value. So they are not uh, considered as individual measurements of, the, uh, of these four measurement points in the standard deviation calculation. And uh, another point to remark here is um, that uh, the, uh, if you take the individual cycle as a basis for your cleaning performance calculation, uh, can be done, and then you should only take the Y values for this cycle and calculate your cleaning performance index. Or you can also take, uh, let's say, if you do three repetitions of a certain cycle, you can take all the stains uh, of these three repetition and calculate the, uh, the standard deviation and this cleaning uh, performance. It depends what you are looking at. Um, and as uh, you have learned in, in the first presentation, we have a wide flexibility in how the standard can be used. Uh, you remember on this uh, different uh, um, cycle uh, uh, series definitions, uh, washing series definitions. So you can have uh, individual runs on the same machine, or you can have different number of machines where you just make one run. And so also this formula can be uh, used according to your test series design. So with this formula, we get for, an, for one stain, we get the cleaning performance. But now we also want to have the overall cleaning performance of these five stains, which we have in our normal standard uh, stain swatch. Um, but we can also use it for the other uh, cleanings. Um, so we have somehow to come to a sum of these uh, five stains. And this we are just simply doing by adding up these sums uh, with a factor of uh, 0 0.2. Uh, 
So each of these five cleaning scores or for the standard uh, cotton swatch uh, contributes to one fifth to the overall cleaning performance. So we are just adding them up here with this AI and uh, the sum of the AI needs to be one, which is when we have five swatches in one uh, stain uh, strip. And you also can combine the standard deviation with this simple adding up the quadratic uh, squares with the weighting factor. Yeah, so this is uh, the, the whole picture to get this new cleaning performance evaluation. What is it, What are the advantages of this? Um, the main advantage is that now we are treating these stains, these individual stains equally according to their washability, how they can be cleaned, how much they are changing uh, their uh, color or their whiteness according to the reference program. And this is another advantage. We are now using the reference machine uh, also as a reference to yeah, calibrate somehow uh, the batches of swatches which we have. Yeah, uh, Because if we have differences in the batches, this will be now um, taken out uh, by using the reference machine cycle as this 100% point. Yeah. So if we have differences in um, the stain spot batches, or if we have differences in the detergent batches, these are all considered by using the reference machine to calibrate the washability of the stain strip. Yeah. So we have some additional advantage and some additional uh, rule for the reference machine, which I think is very good because we have this expensive device and we should use it uh, yeah, better. And this we are doing now with this um, new way of cleaning evaluation. And what we also have is we have additional uh, statistics. We take into account now also the variance in the cleaning of the individual stains over the whole washing cycle. So we are considering really the variation of the washing performance uh, in the whole load, not only the variation from run to run, but really also the variation within one load yeah and uh, by this we are really making use of all that what we have measured uh, because by by now we, we only sum up the values which is very very simple very stupid so to say now we really make use of the statistics of uh, what is all in the mesh in the measured values i have uh, done after we have developed uh, this uh, new scale. I must also say that uh, Tom uh, Hilgers, our former convener, um, had just a, a good contribution in this scale, but this was really also developed and discussed in, in all the uh, working groups of IEC 59DE. And it was uh, used already, and I can show you some examples. Uh, what I have here is a measurement which was done um, within a European uh, project. It was the Atleti project where the declaration of washing machines uh, was checked by the European Union. Um, and here we had uh, 62 washing machines in test. And uh, they were all tested, and you see here the results on the x-axis. You have so 62 machines. Not all are different. There are some machines in, in more than one uh, unit uh, included here, but that's not relevant for us. But you see here 
the Y values. So the old procedure, how we are doing it. Um, and you see here the overall Y value um, of the uh, cleaning performance. Um, and you see the contribution uh, from those uh, machines, from the stains in different colors. And what is uh, surprising is that, uh, no, not surprising for you as an expert, but what you see is that, is that blood, the gray scale, the gray bars, uh, they are almost as big as the other four bars together. Yeah, or at, at, let's say at minimum one third of um, the whole value is coming from the blood value. And, and this is showing this problem, which uh, I started first, that uh, one stain is contributing uh, a lot to the overall value by the others, like the orange one here, which is the carbon black, but also the sebum, they are not contributing as much. And therefore, uh, let's say gains in, in blood are much more relevant as gains in sebum or carbon black. So this is the original values. And when you do this now with this new formula, when you transfer that to the cleaning performance, um, you see here now the sum of the five CIs, uh, not the average as I just explained. It's a sum now, so it's a bit about five and more. Um, and But you see here on the contributions uh, that now those five stains are contributing more equally, which is not surprising because we have taken the cotton 60 as a reference program. And these data here are also for cotton 60 uh, programs. And, and so you see, uh, we are in the range of the reference machine a bit better because this is the requirement in Europe uh, to be a bit better. And this is also exactly reflected here in these values. And uh, the contributions of the five stains is, uh, is uh, similar, so to say. Yeah. But you see, when you compare it with the former one, this is the old and this is the new, uh, you see that the uh, differences um, are now um, enlarged. Yeah. So this cleaning performance gives some, some more spread in the data. Yeah, I go back and force one. So if you look at this, you can you can see that. You see this also when uh, I really compare the now the, the the ratio, the washing performance ratio. You see here in in red, and the new cleaning score um, is now shown in blue. So you see there is some more spread in the data, um, which is coming from this uh, new scale. So it is really a change in the scale, uh, what we have with this uh, new cleaning ratio. Yeah. So these are two different scale. This uh, must be clear. This is also visible when uh, I go to a different um, presentation. So here you see on the x-axis, you see our old washing performance scale. And on the y-axis, you see this cleaning performance scale of this 62 washing machines. And you see there is a good correlation. So a good washing machine in the old scale will be also a good washing machine in the new scale. But there is a certain scatter so uh, it's not a one-to-one -one transformation, but it shows different aspects of the cleaning. Yeah? Um, and therefore, you can't expect to get exactly the same values in the new scale, but similar values. Good. What are the advantages? Uh, the first one is 
really that we are treating all stains uh, in a similar way with a similar influence on the total cleaning performance. And we include uh, the whole statistics. So we include also the variation within one wash load. Uh, so within all the stains which are washed in one wash load. And um, yeah, with this, we can have a more equal influence of each of the stains on the final result, um, which we think is, is positive. Um, yeah, and, and it is, uh, yeah, including washability difference between stains. So um, it is really uh, using these uh, different uh, washability and uh, included it in this. And what I highlighted already before is we are somehow calibrating the stains and the detergent and the load yeah, uh, to that what is possible in the reference machine. So we are really using the reference machine in uh, our way to assess the cleaning performance. And uh, yeah, as a consequence, uh, we need to yeah, think about what kind of reference programs uh, we are using. Yes, and uh, we can also include stain variations. Um, within a cycle um, and have uh, also the cycle itself included in the calculation of the statistics. Yeah, the only thing what is uh, additionally needed is to know the uh, values of the unwashed stain. Um, so this is some, some additional measure which we need. Um, we have um, agreed that it is not necessary to measure this unwashed stain for each wash test. Uh, it is sufficient to measure it for one batch under certain conditions which are defined in the standard. So when you get a new batch, um, and when it is stored in the right way and so on, then it's sufficient that you are testing 10 randomly uh, uh, cleaning swatches out of this whole batch which you are getting. This uh, is all implemented in the sixth edition. And this cleaning performance is not only done for the standard cleaning performance, but also for the wool and the cold water cleaning performance. And we have also defined the reference programs, uh, which you see listed here. Uh, cotton 60 for all cotton programs, synthetic plant 40, wool 40, and cotton 20 degree for cold water programs. And as I said, the unwashed may be determined for the whole batch of stain strips um, if you take 10 randomly selected samples out of the batch uh, you can do it so i think this is a uh, an improvement of the standard it will deliver us new values yes but they are much more relevant these new values for the assessment of the cleaning um, of uh, a really of a washing machine uh, much more as we have it today. The formulas are included in the evaluation sheet, so it will be done automatically, but you can have a look at the formulas and you can also, I think, copy them um, or you will get later on an Excel sheet, which is not protected to make a copy and paste uh, these formulas into your sheets. Yeah, this was my part. And if there are questions, I'm happy to answer them now, please. 
I have one question. Um, the evaluations that show now, they are all done with IECA star or uh, are they also already compared with IECP? No, they are all done with, with A star. We have not applied it with IEC key, I would say. Uh, at least not in a round robin test, uh, because the IACP is quite quite new, uh, and therefore I don't know that it was used. But it's straightforward; it uh, is used quite in the same way. But let's say uh, the advantage is that with this calibration, we calibrate it also to the reference cycle when it is used with IACP. Yeah, I'm just asking because uh, we see with IECP that the blood is a problem and you showed that blood is the main reason or the, the main changing in the evaluation. And that's why I'm asking. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. More questions, please. Yeah, if that's not the case, then I will hand over to Gundula. I stop here and Gundula will share her screen with you and we come to the second part. Okay, I will do so. I hope that you can now see my screen. I will yeah. put it into presentation mode. So Thanks. now we come to the second part of the webinar. Um, it has actually two parts. In the agenda, first is water and energy consumption and program duration, and also the corrections already mentioned by Rainer. I think we're going to spend there, let's say, about 20 minutes. Then there is time for questions regarding water energy consumption program duration. And then the second topic I'm going to talk about today is the temperature inside the wash load. And again, after that, there will be sufficient time for questions. But feel free at any point in time to raise your hand so that we can answer your questions immediately. Let's start with energy consumption. The measurement itself is described in clause 8.3 in CD2. And I would like to mention first that from my point of view, recording of water and energy consumption and also the determination of program duration is mandatory for each test run. We do that for many years in the laboratories and it gives you a clear indication about the program, how it is running and if, we, if everything went correctly there. So therefore, it is always good to record the water and the energy consumption and the program duration, and it is mandatory in the standard cleaning test. Um, there's only one test that is mentioned in CD2 where it might be not mandatory, and that's the wool shrinkage. Personally, I would recommend also for you as participants of the round robin test, if you do something about wool, make sure also to record water and energy consumption and therefore also the program duration. It will help you a lot in the evaluation afterwards to do interpretations of your test runs. So therefore keep that in mind and it shouldn't be any issue nowadays anymore to record that. Let's have a look to the introduction of clause 8.3. It mentions typical operations such as washing, rinsing, and spin extraction. But it also says that um, in this clause, it is specified how to come up with the duration of the whole program and how to calculate total water and energy consumption. Keep that in mind when I introduce a bit more about the detailed measurement and evaluation for energy and water consumption. It starts with equipment and lab installation, how to measure energy and water. Equipment and lab installation matters a lot here. So therefore, when you start to prepare for testing, I recommend that you have a look to Annex Y. Annex Y is a new annex. 
and it puts together all the test instrumentation that you will need in your work. It talks in its explanations about minimum resolution and minimum accuracy, which is requirements for your equipment, but it takes also into account the whole measurement chain, as was mentioned, I think, already in webinar number one. So have a look to your sensor calibration, have a look to transmission conversion and your instrument, instrumentation before you start the round robin test. The second annex that I want to mention here is Annex K. It includes a laboratory internal testing guide and it gives you a lot of hints how to make sure that water and energy is supplied according to the required specification. Uh, for instance, if the maximum current is sufficient, you better check out beforehand. It tells you about specified voltage, water pressure and temperature. And it reminds you that instruments must be calibrated. When you look to the um, Excel that you have to fill in in the round robin test, you find that in the sheet global, there you have also to report all the instrumentation in your laboratory, including what is listed here, uh, accuracy, calibration, and so on. So keep that in mind when preparing for the test. Let's have a closer look to the energy now. There's a table Y1 in Annex Y, and it gives you the requirements for the electrical energy consumption measurements. The program energy, the metered one, should be measured with the minimum resolution of one watt hour and the minimum accuracy is plus minus one percent or eight watt hours per day. It gives you also under the additional requirements a couple of hints and refers to another IEC standard for more information. Keep that in mind when preparing for testing and check out if your equipment is in line with requirements. In this table Y1, also the low power mode is mentioned. The low power mode is not part of today's webinar. In webinar number 10, you will learn a bit more about low power modes. But keep in mind, the equipment that you need to measure low power modes might be different in your laboratory due to the requirements coming from these low power modes. You know, these are very small amounts of energy consumption and therefore you need a very precise equipment. And here is also mentioned IEC 62301 that tells you a bit more about the measurement instrumentation for the low power modes. When measuring energy, you need in the preparation first to make sure that the voltage and the frequency in your lab is according to the appliance requirements. So voltage and frequency shall have a minimum accuracy of 0.5%. And energy data shall be recorded at equal measuring intervals, not greater than one minute. For sure, you need to keep in mind what was said before in another webinar, the data collection should always commence well before the program is initiated and continue after the end of the program. Now we have a look to the requirements for the water consumption. The water consumption as listed here is mainly about volume, but for water consumption also temperature and pressure is relevant. And in the overall calculation for the energy, the link between volume and temperature plays an important role and we will come back to that later. The water consumption, the volume is recorded in the unit liters and the minimum resolu resolution should be 0.1 liters with a accuracy of plus minus 2%. I think it's clearly understood that separate metering for hot and cold water inlets is necessary when needed. And um, the temperature measurement of the inlet water temperature also refers to the requirements from the standard for cold water 15 plus minus two Kelvin, just to remind you. The water temperature measurement is done at a minimum resolution of 0.1 degrees Celsius with a minimum accuracy of plus minus 0.6 Kelvin. And 
The water inlet temperature shall be recorded at intervals of at least once per second. And why this is the case, we will further discuss in the next slides. Water pressure matters when you uh, measure a household washing machine in your laboratory. You have to make sure that the pressure of the water supply is always the same and constant. And the value that you need, you see here in this slide. So therefore, make sure to check your manometer or your pressure meter, however you call it in your laboratory, that it has a minimum resolution of 10 kilopascal and a minimum accuracy of plus minus 5% um, in your tests. Now back to the water inlet temperature. The water inlet temperature is varying for sure because you need to stabilize that. You will have, I guess, some kind of water preparation in your laboratory. And regardless whether it's batchwise preparation of the correct water hardness or whether it's continuous preparation of the water hardness, to bring that water from the tank to the machine itself requires a circulation system. Otherwise, you are not able to maintain the temperatures as required here, 15 plus minus two degrees Celsius for the cold water and 60 plus minus two for the hot water in this required range. In the connection to the machine itself, there should be only a minimum volume and we will see that here. So from the tank to the machine itself, there should be a circulation system and the machine in the installation should be as close as possible to the circulation line. And there is a 250 milliliter requirement in the standard and it has been there before. So you allow only 250 milliliters to be out of the range as specified in the standard for the water inlet temperature. You need to keep that in mind when checking your lab installation. So therefore the point where you measure the temperature of the inlet water should be as close as possible to the connection of the supply hose of the washing machine. The impact of the changes in water supply temperature are also explained in Annex P9. If you need some further background, feel make sure to read that part to better understand why the impact of deviations in the temperature is essential. Water pressure. When you have such a tank and you have to circulate the water, for sure you need a pump to power the supply. The water pressure in this um, connection close to the machine should not exceed the range as given here and the nominal value is 240 kilopascal. So you need to measure that as close as possible to the connection at the same spot where you measure the temperature of the inlet, the water inlet, and you have to make sure that the pressure is not exceeding in its alterations this range as given here. Uh, when it comes to the reference machine, there are maybe slightly deviations to all what I was explaining here. So for the reference machine, you will find more information in webinar number seven that will follow. Now to the evaluation of water and energy consumption. We start with the energy consumption. The energy that is consumed over a program is metered, but this metered energy consumption is not the total energy consumption. The total energy consumption includes also a cold water correction and a hot water energy. So both are to be taken into account when calculating the overall energy consumption. The formulas as given in the standard are listed here. And you see that you always calculate the deviation from 15 degrees Celsius. So for the cold water correction, this is in the range of 13 to 17 degrees Celsius because that's the range where the water inlet temperature can be maximum 15 plus minus two. 
When it comes to the hot water energy, it is usually 60 degree Celsius water inlet temperature, but it might deviate from that depending on the appliance itself. And all what you need to supply the hot water is taken into account in the total energy consumption. The average inlet temperature of the water supply is relevant here, but you do it on a volume weighted basis for each operation. So you have to check whenever there is a water inlet, is it cold water, is it hot water? And over the time of this filling, you need to know what's the volume and you need to know what's the temperature. So you really have to calculate that for each operation and then you sum it up afterwards. Gundula. It is a stepwise. Yes, please. There is a question from Dorata. Can we just ah, take okay. it? Yeah, we can. Sure. Dorata, please go thank, ahead. Thank you a lot. I have a uh, short question for the hot water. Evaluation is minus 15 also. Is it yes. the same? Okay. That's correct. It is due to the fact that the hot water that is sourced for the operation of the washing machine is also energy. So you need to provide this energy before you supply it to the machine, but it's included in the overall total energy consumption that is needed for washing. So you add that heating up of the water supply to the total energy consumption of the machine. Is this clear? Yeah, thank you. Okay, good, thanks. So it is stepwise filling. This is uh, what I wanted to end, uh, identicate with these stairs here in the picture. So there might be alternating filling steps of cold and hot water and you need to check that out. That's why the recording of this filling phases is quite important. As I mentioned before, you need to know the water consumption. You need to know the temperature of the inlet and you have to calculate it volume wise for each single operation. If one wants to know what this figure 860 is about, this is only about the calculation. So one kilo out, but our equals 3600 kilojoule. And this 4.186 is the specific heat capacity of water. So it's only a calculation in the units that you need to take into account that you heat up water here. So when it comes then to the reading and the temperature, I mentioned already, you need to integrate over each operation. And therefore you need to have an accurate average weighted temperature and volume recording at intervals throughout each operation in these fillings of once per second. The total electrical energy after summing up the metered energy plus the cold water correction, plus the hot water correction is expressed in kilowatt hours and rounded to the nearest 0.01 kilowatt hours. Next is water consumption. Water consumption is mentioned in clause 9.2, how to evaluate that. I would say it's quite simple compared to the energy because it's the sum of all operations of a washing program. The water volumes are expressed in liters and rounded to the nearest 0.1 liter. So therefore separate volumes for hot and cold water shall be reported if this applies to your machine under test, but the total water consumption is also reported. And you only need to take care a bit more about these filling steps as mentioned before, because there you needed to correct the energy consumption. Now, a couple of words about the program duration. The program duration actually is defined, and this is from the section definitions of our standard. It's the duration from the initiation of the program, and it's excluding any user program delay until the end of the program. The definition of the end of the program in the former edition five of the standard is a bit lengthy in writing here. It is a bit shorter but it is easy to understand, I guess, because the end of program is reached when the washing machine indicates that there is an end of program. Such indication might not be there, but usually nowadays it is. 
and the load is accessible to the user. And that's the important point. You can open the door. And for sure, you need to know a bit about the machine under test, but you will realize that when being next to the machine at the end of the program. So you need to check that out if you are not able to include that in recording in any way. About what is in the middle written here, the combined program duration, I will not talk today because this is included in webinar number 10, when we will hear about multi-compartment washing machines, which are nowadays on the market. There it becomes a bit more complicated because, because if there is more than one drum, you need to find out when the program starts and when the program ends. And that's why there's a new definition also in the section of program duration introduced into the standard. So the program duration itself is rounded to the nearest minute and you have to average the values during each test run within a test series into the overall of a test series. I would like to mention at this point that there might be nowadays for some appliances under test deviations in water energy consumption and program duration. And this is due to specific uh, intermittently recurring functions um, like rinsing a machine, additionally automatically triggered and things like that. This is very specific and this is something you can check out in the standard as well. It will not apply to our round robin test. With that, I'm summarizing all about energy water duration. So I would like to remind you that recording from my point of view is mandatory for each test run. You better do that. And they are closely linked to each other. And you need to keep into you need to keep in mind the necessary circulation system in your laboratory and the measurement as close as possible to the point where the appliance is connected to your water supply. And you have to check out the temperature and the pressure at that connection as close as possible. And there should be only 250 milliliters that are not taken into account for each single run. So this is all about the requirements and you will learn a bit more about intermittently recurring functions as just mentioned and multi-compartment washing machines and low power modes in webinar number 10. That's the end of this part and I'm happy to take any questions right now. Esteban, you have a question? Uh, yes, Gundula, thank you. I, I was wondering about the cold energy correction. Uh, I mean, the volume used uh, for that correction is until the heater is off, right? I mean, if you have a cold rinsing program, that volume is not taken into account, right? The cold, no, the volume must be always linked to the amounts and the water supply when filling. I mean, is the uh, until the heater is off or during the whole program? Because sometimes we have like cold uh, rinsing programs, and, and and when the volume of water is is increased, and I I think that that volume should not be used, or or sh should we use that volume too? You should use all volumes before the heater is switching on. But if there is further fillings and reheating afterwards, you need to take that into account as well. That's why it's, it's each operation that you need to take into account. And I mentioned in the very beginning, I think it's also here mentioned these uh, operations. So whenever the heater is switching, switching, switching on afterwards, you need to take into account everything what was happening beforehand. But not the rinsing water. Thank you. Not the rinsing water, no, no. Unless there is a hot rinsing. Yes, yes. If we have hot rinsing, yes. If not, that we don't. If it, if it triggers you. the heater, like you say, Esteban. Yeah, you're right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Further questions about this part? 
If this is not the case, then I will proceed. And now we come to the temperature, the temperature inside the wash load. The temperature inside the wash load is a new measurement introduced for edition six. It hasn't been there before. So if in the past in laboratories, uh, sometimes the temperature was measured, it was most likely the temperature of the suds of the water in the washing machine, but not the temperature inside the wash load. The representative maximum temperature actually is what we are aiming at in this measurement. And uh, this is related to a washing operation. And like we just discussed, it has to take into account whenever there is a heating or a hot cold filling, what is the maximum temperature that is reached inside the base load. About the measurement and evaluation method, there is a separate Annex X and about the loading procedure for these data loggers that are included in the load, you will learn in Annex H. But have a look first to this data logger. The specification here is the one that was developed in Europe because in Europe we are already using this type of data loggers. And uh, this specification uh, was discussed in the European team and considered being sufficient and supply of such sensors is possible. So you need to take into account all these data that are listed here and check that with the supply that you find when buying such sensors. You need for each test run three pieces and these three pieces are attached to base load items. And we would like to see the temperature inside the wash load and for sure there might be differences throughout the load, especially in the heat up phase. But whenever the temperature is reached, we hope that these three data loggers that are attached to the base load mirror very well the upper part, the middle part and the lower part of a load inside the machine. So therefore in the loading instructions Annex H, it is included in the upper, lower and middle part. Um, and we aim at having it equally distributed throughout the load to give you a good picture with these three data loggers about the temperature that is reached inside the base load. In the Annex X, you find the information that it is included in the pillowcase for cotton. It is also included in the pillowcase for synthetic blends, and it could be included in a polycotton item. In the wording of CD2, maybe you find somewhere still a wording that is a leftover from the European standard where it's copied from, that the temperature data logger is to be included in a towel. In Europe, in the European standard that is already under use, it is actually included in pillowcases and towels according to the instructions there. For the international standard, we change that and we change that for good reason, because you know that we also have several other swatches that we need to add to the load, like the gentleness of action ones. Since they are covered by a towel, it is really not so easy to make it evenly distributed and taking into account all the options that we have. And that's why in CD2, you find this data logger always included for a pillowcase in the cotton load and not explicitly mentioned for synthetic blends in the pillowcase as well in the Annex H, I guess. And also you can do it with the polycotton item. So there it is quite simple. And for cotton, it's the most complicated procedures because we had to supply the loading instructions up to 25 kilo taking into account all these measurement um, sensors here and swatches on the other hand. The fixation, and this is the photos that we see in CD2, clearly visible, it is partly a towel. So we may want to change that for the final document again and make it only pictures with a 
pillowcase to avoid uh, some misunderstandings. These fasteners that you see there on the two right pictures is one opportunity and the other opportunity you will see in the left picture. I think the left way to attach the data logger to a pillowcase is the better one. It is easier to remove number one and number two, it has less mechanical impact on the washing process. So therefore, personally, when doing that in the lab, I prefer the left uh, fixations. It is always three data loggers, except the load is below three kilo. Then only two data loggers should be used. In Annex H, it is in the tables clearly noted down where to add the temperature logger. So you learned already a pillowcase is the one where you need to attach the data loggers. And you see here the example in table H2, horizontal access washing machines, cotton load, and you see the first four steps, but you see already in step number one, there is a pillowcase, and this is common throughout the tables for horizontal access washing machines, always step one. So in this step, you need to add the temperature data logger if you use that. You see that for 5.5 kilo, for instance, there is one pillowcase. So the one and only would be the one where you add the data logger. If you look to the seven kilo load, you see there is a two. So therefore you pick one of the towels and add the data logger. The folding of a pillowcase is possible with the data logger included because it doesn't change the shape of the item itself. This is the example of the vertical axis table. It's table number eight. And there you see the loading of vertical axis machines is a little bit different. It's loading in groups with steps that go around the circle. And also here, the first one, the first item that goes into the drum in the first group and the first step is a pillowcase. And in this location, also the first data logger is added. And you see here one plus T in the marking. So the marking in the two tables is slightly different, uh, but I think it's easy to understand. This, what you see here in step number one, in group number one, it's the lower part because the loading of a drum starts from the button to the top. And for sure, if you scroll down the tables, you will find also the middle part and in the end, the upper part where the other two data loggers go in. Now, next point is data acquisition. The data acquisition should be done according to the supplier's instruction. The recording is to be started before or at the start of a test run. It may depend on the type of the data logger. I can here only say something about the data loggers we are using. So usually I have to bring them to a computer and from the computer program, I tell um, that the recording should start. Then I attach it to the pillowcase and then I go to the washing machine <laughs> and start the loading procedure. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Since the <clears throat> time recording of the data logger is most likely not with the um, other recording system for water consumption, energy consumption, program duration, and so on. You need to synchronize the cycle time of the recording for the washing machine with the, with the um, recording of the data logger afterwards. So we have to check that out, how to do that. But since both are going with a time stamp, in its recording, I think this is only a software topic to get it synchronized. The sampling rate should be once per second at least. And after the removal from the base load at the end of the test run, the data acquisition has to be stopped. And then the data must be read out and evaluated. Another point in the test procedure is the validity of the test because with this new sensors and also our procedure, 
there might be technical failures during a test run. Validity of test runs is also a part of the standard. You will find that in the document itself. But since this is a new element, I would like to explain that a bit here. And it is clearly pointed out in Annex X that talks about this new measurement. Technical faults can always occur, like the data logger is not recording the whole test run. So if it stops its recording before the end of the main wash of a test run, this would be an invalid test run. Because we expect that the maximum temperature in normal case is reached during the main wash. How this applies to machines that may heat up the water also in the rinses what not, was not yet discussed because this is not that common nowadays. So if further refinement on that point is needed, just let me know. So a technical fault is considered if the temperature is not completely recorded until the end of the main wash of a test run. The second point is what always can happen that the temperature data logger becomes detached from the load at some point during the test run. Mechanics inside the washing machine is well known, so therefore a fixation may break. This makes this data logger an invalid one in the evaluation. But the overall test run is only invalid if a failure of more than one data logger occur. So if only one data logger is not able either to record until the end of the main wash or is not uh, really staying inside the pillowcase and its fixation, um, then this is an issue because you can still calculate from the two data loggers that have recorded very well the process. But if two of the data loggers become invalid due to the topics mentioned here, then the whole test run regarding temperature measurement would be invalid. Assessment of data for this data logger. As mentioned before, we aim at evaluating the maximum temperature and the maximum temperature is defined as the value that is reached for five minutes inside the base load. So you need in the evaluation to calculate the temperature that has been reached or exceeded for a total of 300 seconds. And these 300 seconds do not need to be consecutive. So how is this done in a practical way? When recording the data, you have always a couple of the time and the temperature for each data log logger. And you can sort these couples of data in a descending order. So starting with the highest number in the list of sorted temperatures, and then you have to identify the X value down the list where you fulfill the requirement as mentioned here. So if the sampling rate is well known, um, after 300 seconds, so the X value is the one that you would like to take as the maximum temperature that is reached for five minutes. So you have to calculate the maximum temperature for each of the three temperature data logger. You have to have an average value for the test run and you have to have an average value for the test series. And you have to record that um, in the data collection. I have added here also some picture because I think it's maybe a bit hard to understand that. So what you see here is the way how the temperature goes up and down in the process and uh, the picture includes also reheating. So the temperature is going up and down a bit um, and you see what is above the red line is what was reached for in total 300 seconds, meaning five minutes, but not consecutive. And the temperature that you could read then there is the value that you have to report <clears throat> as the temperature that is reached for five minutes. If you compare the data loggers, 
this is a picture that would be a correct one, I would say so. All the three loggers are very close next to each other. If for one data logger you see uh, hard deviating temperatures, that might have several reasons. It might be that it is somewhere trapped in the machine that you didn't see, but then it's still not considered invalid because invalid means the data logger is not recording anymore. And invalid means the data logger is detached from the load. All other occasions where the values look not as perfect as you see it here are still valid that needs to be evaluated. So summary for temperature. Recording with the data logger has to be started before the test run. Make sure to do a good attachment. Stay with the loading order. Check um, after the end of the program when removing the items from the machine if the data logger is still attached. And have a closer look to the evaluation of the data. Is the recording without technical failure, meaning that there is no recording anymore before the end of the main wash. And that's all what I wanted to explain here today. If there's any questions about the temperature measurement, feel free to ask me now. But the floor is open, please, questions. Uh, Gundula, you it's didn't say something about no the evaluation. Um, I think this is, uh, if you haven't done it before, it may be um, a good advice um, how you do it. So if you have the data, the recorded data in an Excel sheet, so you have the, the time and you have the, the measure temperature, you can just mm -hmm. simply make a sorting of the data uh, of the this temperatures. Is what is here? Hmm? Okay. Yeah. You have uh, to sort the temperature data for each logger in a descending order. This is what you mean, right, Rainer? Yes, exactly. I think yeah, this exactly. perhaps wasn't wasn't clear enough. So then yeah, it's yeah, very, very simple sure. to uh, find out when you have these three hundred seconds of temperature above the temperature which you have to measure. And you declare and you record. Mm -hmm. Okay, more questions. Okay, if there are no questions. Ro Rolando yes, is Rolando. asking, I guess. Mm -hmm, I have please. a question related to, to the equipment to measure the temperature. This means that we call it the uh, high button in Europe, as we know. This is a point that uh, uh, the technical specification you mentioned and uh, the technical specification in Europe recommend that the sampling time should be less than 10 seconds. This is uh, in terms of specification. In terms of te test method, you mentioned in the acquisition process a sampling rate that one second. Is it right one second or 10 seconds? That's a very good question. Um, <laughs> I even didn't realize that. Um, in the text of CD2, it reads once per second. But you are right in the specification that says the sampling rate is less than 10 seconds. So maybe we need to fix that and unify it to be 10 seconds. Yeah, oh, because less actually, than 10 seconds. Europe, less Europe, than 10 seconds. Using, yes, in Europe, actually, according to the technical specification, we are using 10 seconds. Yes. Yes. And this is actually um, almost everything in Annex A, uh, X is a copy of the European procedure. The only difference is the attachment to the pillowcases only. So everything else is supposed to be the same as in Europe. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Thanks for the okay. hint. That's good. I will check it out and take some notes in collecting comments for CD2. And I will see where the mismatch is. Because you can't record every second if the data logger is required only to record 
in less than 10. Thank you. Very good. More questions, please. Now is just the chance. We still have time. Okay, if there's nothing, then I would say this was all clear. Thank you very much for uh, attending this webinar. We will continue next week, uh, Tuesday, with the topic of channels of action measurement. So this is something brand new in this uh, standard. And therefore, I, uh, I invite you to attend this next webinar. It will be Günter Bircher, who's with us, who will present to you how we measure the gentleness of action. So thank you very much. I stopped recording.